<laughs> Hi. Uh, this really was by, by chance that today I was looking up Ouija for, for Ouija. I, 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 some people here won't know Ouija was. He was Ouija the famous. He was a very terrific photographer who was a kind of the Rongalela before Rongalela. And he was basically an. He was describing photographing the beginning of the Met Opera season in the 50s. And he said, last night at the opening of the Met Opera season, I rubbed elbows and stepped on the toes of the society crowd. And I don't mean cafe society. There was a difference then. Um, you got a great picture then of these. You got some terrific pictures. Like picture. these bag women, I think, wasn't it? I just want to make this oh, little Steiner. point wrong. It was a great shot. Then on November 1945, he wrote, he was shooting pictures with ultra, but he used, uh, he used infrared so he could take pictures in the dark without people seeing, you know. And he developed his pictures right in his uh, trunk of the car. Yeah. And he was there before the policeman. He had a, uh, what do you call it, one of those radios, hmm. police radios. And he oh, was yeah. There. And sometimes he planted the hat uh, next to the victim that was on the street. His famous hat, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And he was called Ouija because he was because he was on the police band. He was like a Ouija board. He always knew where the action was. Yeah. But the point it, he wrote, I couldn't see what I was snapping, but I could almost smell the smugness. Yeah. And the point is, back then, high society, they didn't care about the tabloids. They were not interested. They did not depend on publicity at all. In fact, the, the code then was you were in the papers when you were born, when you were married, and when you died. Well, the world changed, and Ron is one of the people that changed it. And Studio 54 is one of the places that changed it. You know, suddenly you had a whole new breed of people who desperately needed publicity. But their attitudes, the people who gave them the publicity, like Ron Galella, was very different. Tell us a bit about that, Ron. Well, you see, um, we're all interested in glamour and celebrities. That's why Life magazine didn't go out of business. It went out of business, because... They showed too much, very little of glamour of celebrities. They showed the war and disease, and that, that's why they went out of business. And People magazine, time took the place. And that's successful because we're interested in people, and that's what this business is all about: successful people, famous people, doing things. And uh, so that's why People magazine is, and not just People magazine, all, all over the world we. We like celebrities. We like our heroes. We, we, uh, we all want to be rich and famous too. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it's easy to. All you have to do is work. Find out what you love, and you, you could be famous in whatever you do. You don't have to love what you do. Find out early in life what you're good at, and pursue it. Work. That's what it takes. Ron, I tell, did. Uh, tell I worked about, hard. Uh, tell us about your different, the different reactions you got. For instance, you, one can see in the pictures that you, uh, you've got a picture of Sean Penn slugging one of your fellow photographers, but you see that uh, Mick Jagger and Paul McCartney are very cool. Yeah. They're not being your friends, but they're giving because they know they depend on what you're doing. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I pursued um, Paul McCartney and his wife Linda in the Hamptons, and he was going to several uh, private places where I couldn't shoot in uh, private homes. But finally he went to the an a and market, and I got him coming out, and I started shooting him with his wife, Blender, and his baby. And he said, Ron, all you have to do is ask. And he posed for the great picture that I got in the Life cover, I mean the People magazine cover. <laughs> and. Uh, and that's what he said, all you have to do is ask. And that's one of my um, techniques that I have in my new book that's coming out at the end of this year on uh, um, a, guy to be a, a, a guy to be a paparazzo. The stories behind the pictures, that's what it's about. How I got that picture of Paul McCartney with the baby. Is, well, you have to ask or, or just start shooting fast. And there's other techniques that I, 22 techniques that I use in this new book that's coming out at the end of the year. But my current book is Rangalala, New York. And it's, uh, New York is to me the greatest place to shoot pictures because it's condensed. Everything is close. The hotels, the theaters, 
everything, and it's saturated with celebrities. Where LA is the opposite. LA is stretched six, 60 miles big, and you have to travel a lot to get the stars there. Of course, Beverly Hills is the best place <laughs> to get them there, but New York, you don't have to travel much. You could almost go by foot from one place to another. And that's why I call my New York my girlfriend, and Jackie, of course, my girlfriend, too, my favorite subject. But I lived in the Bronx. That's where I was born and grew up, and it was 12 miles from Manhattan. And, uh, and I had, uh, was a ceramic artist in New York. Uh, and then the Korean War broke out in the 1950s. So rather than be drafted in the Army, I enlisted in the Air Force. And that's where I got my career. The United States Air Force gave my career in photography. I qualified to be a photographer with aptitude test. And I, for four years, I became a photographer in the Air Force. Then after the uh, uh, discharge, 1955, I went to one of the best colleges, the Art Center College of Design in Hollywood, and uh, got a degree in photojournalism there, majored. And even while going there, I was curious about celebrities. And I would crash premieres like Guys and Dolls, where one night I would photograph 50 stars like Frank Sinatra, William Holden, Lucille Ball. It was crazy. And I just crashed. All they do is put dress good and have a lot of cameras. In those days, you, you don't have to be on the list like today to get, a, to get on a press list. And it was easy to crash. So I was interested in glamour. Then I came back to New York. And it was a recession, 1958. And uh, I... I lived in the Bronx, my father's house, 12 miles from Manhattan. I had no money to have a studio, even though I was qualified to do studio work. So I built a photo lab in my father's basement, and I crashed premieres, I got celebrities wherever I could get them, parties, premiere parties, and or Broadway, and on the streets. and. The world became my studio. That's how I became a paparazzo. I was forced because I had a camera, I had a lab to develop, and that's how I freelanced. And uh, I first Jack, I got pictures of Jackie May, 1967, and uh, it was at the Willinston Gallery in Madison Avenue, and it was very difficult to get good pictures because it was crowded. So I followed her, and that's how I found out where she lived, 1045th Avenue. And I always could beat her to the apartment because 85th is one way, and her limousine had to go 86th around. So I was there always to get her arriving. And I got better pictures there uh, that night because there was no security in the way or uh, everything. It was cleaner shots. So that's how I discovered Jackie. But, they, but I didn't sh shoot her right away. That was the first time, night, May 67. The second time was December 10th, 1967, when she made an appearance at the Plaza Hotel for the 500-plate uh, dinner benefiting the Democratic Party. You know, And I got a great picture of her. There were a lot of celebrities there. Uh, Ted Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Cary Grant, and many such, and FDR Jr. Anyway, I got her, and Newsweek ran that picture, one of our great portraits of Jackie. So I just, I said, oh, she's marketable. She, I could sell pictures of her. So in 1968, I continued shooting her for 10 years, and uh, she was my favorite subject. She was my favorite subject because she didn't pose. I don't like posed pictures. I don't like calling celebrities, look at my camera. I'd rather get them in action. And Jackie was great for that. She was full of life, movement. Go to the ballet, go to here, and date different people. And it was interesting. And I'm good at shooting movement. Uh, I want to capture life, freeze it with the camera. And uh, she was my favorite subject for us because of that. So anyway, but I, I got, even I would stake her out. 
And a typical night, I would stake her out. If she didn't go out, I would go to cover New York. It was always something at Studio 54. It was great place for Steve Rebell inviting what celebrities are in town there and celebrities like to see other celebrities that's why it was a good place like it was a good place for Halston, Liza, Liza Minnelli, uh, uh, Bianca Jagger, Andy Warhol. You had a good relationship with Warhol. Pardon? You yes. had uh, Warhol called me his favorite photographer in his uh, um, book um, and he, 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 I guess, he liked me because, well, first of all, we had the same social disease. We always wanted to be at the same place, uh, all the places in New York. There were so many events happening and we exchanged information, we were friendly and that. But he was, um, he was, he liked me because he, he, we had the same interest in the same celebrities. He liked, Jackie, he liked Elvis and Liz Taylor, etc. And he liked me because I, I got them. I was a, a sort of, uh, I got the pictures paparazzi style. And he was too shy. See, he was a shy guy, and he he was usually in the picture. He would give his camera or get in the picture with celebrities. So he was. I was more of an outsider. And being an outsider, I like that because I want to be in control. I'm the artist, and I want to compose and pictures the way I want. My style is to capture stars that are being themselves, doing things, and that's the way you do. Th you be yourself, like Philip Holtzman. Uh, he did the most life covers, over 50, 75 life covers. And after his session, he would shoot the star jumping. Whether it was Einstein or Sophia Loren, he had him jump. And jumping, the star forgot Philip Holtzman, the photographer, forgot the camera, and they were themselves. And that's what I do. I capture stars being themselves, you know and doing things and that's what we're after everybody has an identity uh, and and that's what we want to try to capture on film ron i think we've all seen the celebrity landscape darken i mean just today we read in the papers about the the daughter of robin williams getting sent tweets with with uh, yeah. horrifying pictures of her dead father and it's strange. Now celebrity coverage has become more and more hostile. Instead of paparazzi, we have stalkerazzi. Did this begin in your time? Well, um, with the trials of Jackie, uh, I, it became famous, this word paparazzi in the news every day of the trial. It was a 26-day trial in New York. Uh, and But now it's, it's become... Uh, sort of uh, a bad name. See, I, I used uh, paparazzi in my letterhead, photography with the paparazzi approach. But my approach, I qualified, it was the trying to get the exclusive picture, the spontaneous picture, the off-guard picture. And the only game, the only game means to hide, to get these pictures being themselves. Like one of my most famous pictures, Jackie on Madison Avenue. I got that in a taxi, back seat of a taxi, shooting her. And uh, the, luckily the driver of the taxi blew his horn. He was interested in Jackie too. And I didn't tell him to blow the horn. And Jackie turned and I got that picture. My greatest picture, windblown Jackie, is what I call it, my Mona Lisa. And she was looking toward me, but she didn't know it was me because I had the camera in my face. But when I got out of the taxi, right away she put on my glasses, she knew me. And I got a few more pictures for one more block. And then on 90th Street, she turned west and she turned around and said, are you pleased with yourself? I said, yes, thank you, and I left. My greatest picture. I like the picture of Elaine throwing a dustbin lid at you. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, uh, there's some writer that interviewed me, uh, something Penn, her name is. She works for the New York Post also. She's doing a book on uh, Elaine Kaufman, and um, 
I call her, she had to write something about her for her book. And I, in a way I said she's a hypocrite because she, um, first of all she called me a putz in my documentary, Smash's Camera, and she had a round table with celebrities. Uh, celebrity photographers talking about me, for my work, by, for my books. But uh, she um, she threw this one night, I got pictures of her, she threw this ash can lid at me, but she missed. She hit the limousine and uh, missed me. And um, so anyway, she called, she said, I'm, uh, I treat these celebrities as people. But she really doesn't. She treats them special. She escorts them to her limousine, whether it's Woody Allen or Mia Farrow, etc. And uh, she treats them special. So she, uh, I, th I, I call her a hypocrite in a way. But she treats them special, and I treat them special too. So uh, it's not that bad. Is there any Have you ever taken a photograph that you wouldn't sell? Yes, uh, I, um, well, there's a couple. Once I shot, uh, at Grand Central, there was a, they were honoring Jackie Onassis, and, uh, of course, she was dead at the time. She's not there, but uh, Caroline Kennedy was there, and, uh, uh, John Jr. And I photographed John Jr. because he gave me permission to shoot him. But I could not shoot, by law, Caroline. Even to this day, I cannot shoot her. I could shoot her, but I could risk her taking me to court with a restraining order. I, I have to pay a fine of $120,000 or seven years in jail. Because I lost the trial in 1972, where Jackie claimed I invaded her privacy and harassed her. So, when I shot John Jr. coming out of this event at Grand Central, Caroline was behind her, so I, I couldn't release that picture because she could, I'm not supposed to photograph J uh, Caroline, mm -hmm. so that's one picture that I could not release. And I tried to get permission from her to release it, she never answered. She's, Caroline is sort of anti-press, anti-paparazzi and all that. There's one other photograph that I did not release. I once photographed uh, Jackie at an event at the um, the um, seafood restaurant in Grand Central. I forgot the name of it. Anyway. The Oyster Bar. Yeah, the Oyster Bar, correct. And she, <laughs> I got her shooting her and she, she had a bad expression with a Adam's apple popping out and I couldn't release that picture. I didn't, it was unflattering. I didn't like it. Hmm. And uh, that's, uh, maybe is there, are there anybody who have questions that you want to ask? Yeah. No questions? <laughs> Please. Uh, nowadays it just seems paparazzi style photography is a gigantic marketplace. It just would seem that the market was a lot smaller then. Was there a lot of work to go around? How did you sell a lot of the images? The question is, how has the market changed? Is that what you said? Yes, and what was it like in the beginning of your career? Was there a well, large market? Well, when, when I photographed uh, celebrities in the 60s, 70s, and even the 80s, it was easy. It was one-to-one. -one. There was not many paparazzi. And that's what was free to move about and get great pictures that I did. But nowadays, it became so popular, expanded. There's so many photographers, the, the markets expanded. Since, uh, since People Magazine started in 1975, 74 rather, they started, then the star came. The only ones that existed before then was the National Enquirer, which was a good market. And there was about 12 or 15 uh, movie fan magazines like Photoplay, Modern Screen, etc. And that was a big market. They would pay $1,000 for a take of Jackie or any big celebrity like Elizabeth Taylor, either the Lennon sisters or Doris Day. And uh, you shot one cover shot and a few black and whites. 
thousand dollars and it was a big market then but then people magazine came about 1974 and the star and they put these magazines out of business these modern screen and uh, photo play they're out of business because they were monthlies and people magazines were and star and tabloids were weeklies and they were more accurate in in reporting celebrities as uh, these fan magazines would um, not tell the truth you know they were crazy stories and today the paparazzi are the market gets so overexposed with so many celebrities i mean so many photographers shooting and it became dangerous and bad it's vulgar it's today it's vulgar they look for cellulite to warts and all and all that crap uh i did not do that i i always shot the face to me is the most beautiful most expressive part of the bodies and uh, that's what i like to capture the expressions like i got a great picture of lauren mccall in my twitter we have over 500 to, uh, today Be beautiful picture of her walking at uh, the tony awards when she was getting uh, a tony award for applause. but this is in daylight walking great expression but not posed great that's what I love. Uh, you have a question, I think. Any other questions? Uh, do you have Do you have a memorable Studio 54 story that you would want to share? Well, there's many. I have a book uh, called uh, Disco Years by Powerhouse, and uh, there are many celebrity pictures from Studio 54. Well, there's many um, stories. <laughs> well, one is uh, I was barred from Studio 54 when Steve Bell uh, claimed I, I I published a picture of uh, Allie McGraw with her braless and her nipples showed on her breast. It was published in Photoplay, a uh, Playboy rather. <laughs> And another picture was published in People, but the People had a better picture with a cover, you know. But he claimed that Ali McGraw didn't like that picture, but it's not true, because I, I know Ali McGraw and I contacted her and she said she didn't mind it at all. So he lied and he barred me for one month from the studio. But it was another time when I was barred for a more bigger reason. What happened is, the, uh, there was a group W from Baltimore doing interview at my home in Westchester and then they wanted to capture me in action and I said there's a uh, Robin Williams opening at the Copacabana in New York and they followed me and went and I got pictures of Robin Williams there, no problem. And Steve Bell invited us all to the studio after. That was his technique of getting celebrities there, giving them drugs and drinking and whatever. So we all went to the studio 54, and then uh, Steve Bell came over and said, I'm all right to shoot stills of, of uh, Robin Williams dancing or whatever. But they didn't want coverage with the TV crew no filming but then they broke that they they shot me photographing Robin Williams dancing with his wife and then he demanded the film and I knew there's gonna be trouble and he had his big bodyguard requesting the film and I shot a picture of the bodyguard with with Steve Bell asking the crew to give me the film, and I ran out, and then and Steve Bell says, you're barred again from the studio. Uh, because what happened is, there was a big fight. He destroyed the camera, the film, and I was waiting outside because I, I my car was parked at the Copa Cabana, and, we were, and, and I couldn't go home without waiting for their, a lift they're going to give me a lift and then I saw all fighting and noise they all were brought to the police station they were all released except Steve Bell was held 33 hours in the jail because he had violations 
fire violations, I believe, that he didn't pay or answer. So they kept him for 33 hours, and because of that, he barred me for the, whole, the remaining year uh, till 1980, till the Studio 54 closed. I call him a Pinocchio in my, um, my Disco Years book. He's a liar, and he was. Anyway, even there was an event, Save the Elephants, with uh, Peter Beard, my friend. He tried to get me pleading with Steve Burrell in front of the place, because I got the invitations, but he wouldn't let me in. He says, I suffered too much, three, uh, 33 hours in jail. So that was the end. That's the other story of, of Steve Burrell. But, Steve, but the Studio 54 was a great place to photograph celebrities. Uh, and then also, when on the way home to Westchester, where I lived, I went to Elaine's. That was a good place to hang out for celebrities and writers. And I got pictures there, there many times on the way home. I was interested to read uh, that you don't, uh, didn't often go and see the films that these actors were in. You were too busy working. That's true. I uh, hardly uh, would have time to see these films. But once I did see Rocky, when I went on the, uh, the Paramount Theater, where the, he launched that first Rocky film, and it was a cold, very severe cold night, and the PR, even though I was not invited, he let me in and I saw the film. And I got pictures, of course, of uh, Sly Stallone. But um, what was the question again? It wasn't a question, it was an observation. I was saying, although they were, you were obsessed with them or interested in them because they oh were Oh yes, uh, what I want to bring out is that... You didn't actually see the films that I, made I films. hardly saw the films, but now I see them. Because hmm. I'm 83 years old and I don't shoot. I shoot one event a year, that's the Metropolitan Museum costume ball every year. That's the only event. I'm busy doing books and, and I, um, I shoot um, very, uh, very little. I do books. But I, I, um, I lost my train of thought. Well, that's all right. We, I think we got to the station. See, is that a question actually. again? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're just, uh, no, you made sense. It's all right. I think we covered that actually. Um, um, yes, Keith. Hi, I was just curious, did you ever embrace digital photography and did that um, change the way yes, you shot? Because uh, yes. developing is such an important part yes, of... Yes, uh, I, I prefer film, first of all, than the digital. The film records, first of all, it's tangible. I love a piece of film, a negative, and I put it in my jockey when I make fresh prints. And I could sell them in my galleries. Uh, to me, and the film has grain, and I love grain, it gives you the texture of the skin. Where digital, it's pixels, and it's not the same. And I don't like, uh, I prefer the film. But I, st but I did go to digital to compete with the market, and uh, Getty Images is, represents my work, millions of pictures of mine. And we still, I'm still finding more pictures from my negatives that I overlooked scanning them to wire image, uh, uh, Getty rather. <laughs> wire image what was there before they merged with Getty. So uh, 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 most of my stuff is now digital with Getty, it's all. But I still like prints, I still print because there's a market. I make my money not so much with books but with prints. My prints sell in galleries like Staley Wise here in New York. I have galleries in Paris and Amsterdam, Berlin, all over. And uh, like an eight by 10 signed, $2,800 I get. The gallery gets 50%. So I make more money with prints than, uh, than, um, than, um, Books, <laughs> but books are good for publicity, and it's good for displaying a uh, showcase of the pictures that they could anybody could order a picture, and I could make it in the dark room and sell it, you know. And uh, so I, I'm a controversial photographer because I went to court with Jackie, two trials with her, and Brando knocking five teeth. But all this controversy brought attention to me. That's why I'm, in, I'm famous or infamous, have your pick. But 
This is good because even though I lost with Jackie, and I lost five teeth with Brando, it brought attention to my work. And to me, my work speaks for itself. It has, uh, my forte is capturing celebrities spontaneously, like I call the paparazzi approach, where the studio photographers cannot get this. They get the better quality of the, the lighting, the background, the sitting, but the stars are not themselves. They try to be something else. They, they, and, and they, they fuck up. They're not themselves. But I capture them being themselves. Don't call their names. Don't have them pose. And have them doing things relating to each other. That's what makes good pictures. It gives them being themselves where they forget the camera and the photographer. So that's one of my lessons from my new book is hide. <coughs> or don't be obvious. Hide. Rob, when I was looking at the book, when I was looking through it, I know a lot of the images, but it occurred to me, although most of the pictures are taken outside the club, right? Or outside the best club. Oh, that's, so that's the point I wanted to make before. Yeah. I, 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 so if a spaceman who didn't know planet Earth would think human beings spent most of their time getting out of cars, if they so only had this book to go on. And yet, I think a lot of the energy in your pictures comes out of that. Because if you were actually inside the club, there are just people circulating yes. and doing their thing. Because you're getting them in motion, you, I, you catch them a bit off. I uh, have two examples of that. This yeah. is why I lost my train of thought. I got it back now. <laughs> yeah. What happened is I was barred from the Studio 54 by Rebel twice. But the second time was a long time uh, until it closed, almost a year. But I shot outside, I didn't give up, I'm persistent. I get them arriving outside and departing. And I got one of my greatest pictures of Liz Taylor leaving the stage door where I was shooting outside. And she was escorted by Halston and Steve Bell to her limousine. And I got a great picture of her looking very heavy, fat. And it ran, it ran all over. And it ran on the cover of uh, the book, Babylon Hollywood, something like that. So that's one good example. The technique, shoot outside when you're not invited. Another time, I was not invited uh, for the Scarface party at Sardi's. And uh, Bobby Zaram kept me out, the PR. But I got the great picture outside because Al Pacino came out with Kathleen Quinlan, his real girlfriend, and I got a great shot of him with his eyes popping and it ran double page in People magazine. Where the People photographer inside, or the other photographers never got them because he posed with the stars from the film inside, but his real girlfriend he came out with. So sometimes it pays to be outside, like you said. Mm. You get the greater picture because in this case, there's two cases that I, I got great pictures outside. And I like the gesture some of them have. And indeed, uh, Duchess Windsor too, is that kind of waving at you. So they're both saying hello and pushing you away. Yeah, a lot of them, no pictures, they say. I have yeah, another yeah, book yeah, yeah, yeah. called No Pictures, title. We have a lot of celebrities uh, mm. doing this. Mm. And the fight pictures with Sean Penn, Sean Penn and my nephew, Steve, uh, Anthony Savignano. Uh, that book is a great book, too. But most of these celebrities, um, uh, want their picture taken. That's why they do that. They, they don't mean it. But Sean Penn did mean it. <laughs> and a few others do mean it, like Brando, Saki Me. So, um, but it's, most stars love publicity and don't mind being photographed, thank God. <laughs> um, two questions, actually. I, it, it seems that the paparazzi now are kind of mean-spirited and it doesn't seem like they're, they're really autistic, the photographs. They're not, you see. Snaps. Uh, see, yes, uh, they, they rely on luck to get pictures and I don't know how they make a living. There's so many of them getting the similar pictures where it was easy for me, one-to-one, -one with celebrities years ago. So they, and they depend on, they, they want to provoke the stars too, to have them fall or have an accident. That's the old paparazzi in Italy in the uh, Dolce Vita time in 70s, uh, 50s, 59 and 70 or whatever, 60. 
they provoke stars just to make it more saleable, the picture. Uh, which I would I say the same fate as uh, undertaken of celebrity photography as has overtaken pornography, that uh, why should people pay for what they can get free on the internet, really? <laughs> You know, there's, uh, you can, there's non-stop iPhone pictures. Uh, a Boston paper laid off all its photographers a couple of months ago, every single one. You know. See, another thing that the paparazzi do today, um, they, they, not, they do it for the money, number one. See, I, I, I'm an artist. I studied art, and a lot we could learn from art, artists. We could learn composition and painting, color, uh, a lot of things, and most paparazzi today are not educated like I am. And uh, that's what you, it's what you bring to yourself. You have to have an eye, you have to have an eye for composition and color. In other words, a picture has to have a focal point. Like one of my greatest pictures was at the Cody Awards where Halston was, uh, at his party, at his studio. And I got a picture of Halston on top of, like a pyramid. Great composition. And, um, the other models were around him, below him. And that's a good composition, have a, a focal point. Just like the capital of New Washington has the capital as the focal point. The Eiffel Tower is the focal point in Paris. We love a focal point. Uh, Lai likes to draw to one person, or one, one object. Even a portrait should be one eye, not, the, not both eyes. Both eyes looking in the camera is not good composition because your eye don't know which eye to go to. You have to feature one eye or the other, not both. Light one eye or the other. Or turn the portrait, the head, uh, three quarters. Our eyes like to go to one focal point. But there is the other side, a kind of a picture, the circus picture. And I got that at Studio 54, where there was Halston with a bunch of other celebrities, uh, Yves Saint Laurent, etc. But that's a circus type picture. I don't like those pictures. But even then, you like to put the key person in the center, the most important person in the center of that picture. So that's composition. And on a personal question, did you ever um, befriend or have long-term friendships with some of these movie stars? Yes, a lot of stories, uh, some celebrities like me, <laughs> fortunately. Uh, Grace Kelly liked me, and she's in my uh, documentary. Where she, uh, she even photographed me at her uh, son's graduation, uh, Princess, Prince Albert. Um, and um, once I, I wore an umbrella hat at the wedding, her brother's wedding in Philadelphia, and she said, Ron, I like your hat, because I had an umbrella hat in the rain. <laughs> she was not in the rain. But anyway, uh, Lauren Hutton liked me a lot. In fact, once she was at Saturday Night Live, and the party was uh, at the Odeon. Is there a restaurant, Odeon, something like that? West Broadway. And, uh, yeah. And there was a party there, and I got there late. And I told the doorman, I says, tell Lauren Hutton that I'm out here. And she came out and posed for me. That's something, a star coming out of a, uh, a restaurant to pose for me. So, uh, and there's a other f celebrities that did like me. Um, um, <laughs> I can't think of them. <laughs> Oh, Dustin Hoffman, yeah. To me, Dustin Hoffman is one of the actors that he gives the photographer unusual pictures. Example, he comes out of the Plaza Hotel, crosses the street, and he feeds a dog from that fountain. There's a fountain, he cups his hand, and he feeds a dog. I got that great shot. Another time, he goes to a restaurant, and he puts the uh, sunroof down, he pops his head out. <laughs> and uh, it's a great shot, as usual. And he does things that, without asking him. Another time, he, he was married to this ballerina, Byrne, something of uh, her name. She was tall, and he's short, and he's looking up, dancing with her. 
That's another shot. He, and they got a shot with me dancing. I'm dancing with her, some other photographer shot. He grabbed me and danced with me. Um, he, there's other pictures he did without asking. Oh, here's another one. I, wait, I waited for him at the uh, San Ramo Hotel where he was at. He was doing sales of a death of a salesman on Broadway. He comes out, he, he goes over the limousine bumpers, and he's shaving. He's shaving his whiskers. That's another thing. Without asking him, he, uh, he does things, he knows what we want. Unusual pictures always sell. Celebrities doing things again, whether they're pumping gas or doing whatever, shaving in this case. So that's not was the, the best of all the uh, creative pictures for photographers, for, for me anyway. <laughs> Any other questions out there this evening? I think we're going to go ahead and have Anthony read us a little poem before sure. we go into well, our stunning that portion. Yeah. Huh? You don't want to? Okay. We don't have to do that. <laughs> we're actually just... Um, I like it, though. <laughs> I'd like to hear it. Okay. <laughs> it's actually rather... You, you, you compose this yourself, then, right? What? This is your own poem. No, this is the one you read. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's appropriate for the subject matter, too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. At least one person has heard this recently. Um, it's called Mais où sont les neiges d'antan, which is, stands for Where the Snows of Yesteryear, written by Francois Villon, a 15th century French poet who Wikipedia calls a poet, thief, and vagabond. It's like a memory poem. I don't call them poems, I call them rhymes. I don't like poetry very much. Uh, Where the snows of yesteryear, or hula hoops, or greaser hair, miles or bird blowing the blues, the jet set and those Pan Am stews, hot pants or the bubble dress about a Meinhof, the SDS, moon rocks, pet rocks, rockets, red glare, Italian scooters everywhere, Mood rings, love beads, or condomania, sunny and chair to entertain you. Could you dish up nouvelle cuisine, master a new pinball machine? Can you do the frug, the jerk, the twist, where you and Liz or Susie's list? But that, I think, is quite enough of rootling through the thrift store stuff. Forget the easy memorabilia. I want to thrill you kill you, kill you, so follow as we make the scene. The race for the four minute mile, see the pyramids along the Nile, Audrey Hepburn spiffing style, Carmen Miranda on a tropic isle, Bobby Short at the Carlisle, woo, to the dark half of the dial, and this may take a little while. J. Hedger Hoover's curdled bile, Lee Harvey Oswald's bulging file, Jane Mansfield in a speeding motor, Vic Morrow underneath a rotor, Mark Chapman outside the Dakota, Robert Maxwell does a floater, Squeaky from the Manson trial, O.J. Simpson in denial, the way that Enron made that pile, Bernie Madoff's tiny smile, Mais où sont les neiges d'antan? We know just where those folks have gone. Where have the war reporters gone? A bottle of Dewar's, your Olivetti, your boat is waiting at the jetty. Brash mercenaries, a chartered plane, you're off doing that dumb stuff again. Biafra, checkpoints, Lebanon. The Euro Bozo with a gun, you're an action hack, you're Superman. Now magazines are limp and wan. There's no one calling you at dawn. Mais sans les neiges d'antan. Where are the snows of yesteryear? The joys of la vie littéraire? What happened to the literati who'd flocked to a George Plimpton party? The grouchy writers at Elaine's, beating out each other's brains, Kurt Vonnegut and Erwin Shaw, Norman Truman, Absent Gore. Mais où sont les neiges d'antan? Where have New York's last writers gone? Off to tenure, every one. Mais où sont les neiges d'antan? Have the photographers all gone? Ask Henri Cartier-Bresson, Irving Penn, Dick Avedon, Bailey Duffy, Donovan, Helmut Newton, Guy Baudin. Just ask who Mary Ellen Marks, retoucher is, expect some sparks. Don McCullen, Jim Nackway, 
Photoshop wipe your world away. We've pixelated verite. Now phones take pictures everywhere. All that is solid melts into air. Quote from Karl Marx. Where are the snows of yesteryear? Where are the babes of times gone by? Chin chin pudding, here's mud in your eye. Make yourself comfy, sweetie pie. Stunning dress, honey, wouldn't it look even more? Stunning, lying on my bedroom floor. I'd always got the room in a roar. The sunk has set the roll in the hay. The cows away, please won't you stay. Hiding the salami, fun games to play. Mais où sont les dames de ton jadis? And do they still remember me? Okay, now we're in Italy. La Dolce Vita, the Veneto, and MGM Stalin, the Palazzo, the Paparazzi on the go, go, go. Scandals erupt in El Specchio. But suddenly it's Rome, adio. Mais sont les neiges d'antan? Where have the Playboy princes gone? So it's off to London, Babylon, where we have reinvented fun. No more war, but lots more pot. A rich girl in a Fulham squat. Peter Sellers and Sophia in Alvaro's Trattoria. Michael Caine and Terence Stamp. Dine at Annabelle's, dance at Tramp. Art and fashion both go pop. While the last of Empire is going under. Keith Moon, Sid Barrett and Brian Jones. No more rolling for that stone. Have all the birds of Britain flown? What a soul was left, I wonder, when the swinging had to stop. Ciao, Manhattan, we're Euro trash. You need class and we need cash. Late afternoons in Fiorucci, Plato's retreat for Hoochie Coochie, Mortimer's and Jackie O, El Morocco, studio. The VIP room waits below. What happened to that snow, we know. So the drifting snows of memory, twin towers appear in front of me. The twin towers not of Tolkien, but twin towers built for businessmen. And that time and earth too big, too dumb, just skyline hogs in the waterfront, perfect for Philippe Petit's stunt, then they were blown to kingdom come, by death and grief and fear defined, two perfect forms, hope and despair, float suspended in the mind, glimmering in our darkening air. So it's back to you, Francois Villon, poet, thief, vagabond and con, it's fine to sigh for Les Neiges d'Anton. What we'd really like to know is will we see tomorrow's snow and will there be tomorrow's snow?